Hey everybody and welcome. So this video is going to cover uh, the fuselage design of my B36. So I'm creating a series. It's going to have seven or eight or maybe nine parts and I'm going to cover each of the main components of the B36 that I designed well over 10 years ago and got it 99% done and sold it. And I know there's some of you that uh, feel like you got robbed because I never flew it. But um, I'm starting with the fuselage design. And a lot of this is also, I'm calling the B36 2.0 because there's definitely gonna be a B36 I'm gonna build. I've explained in other videos where that's coming in some timelines. It's probably still another two years out because I gotta finish my air bike, my ultralight first. And actually a lot of these videos are gonna be aimed at the ultralight soon because I'm getting it back into my garage because it's warming up and it had to go in storage during the winter. But let's dive into the B36 uh, fuselage. So as you remember, if you followed me, if you're new, welcome. I designed a 257 inch uh, B36 um, D with the jet engines on the tips that were gonna be EDF ducted fans. And um, there was a lot of pain along with designing this. Uh, many mistakes I made, many things I learned you know, and, and, you know, I, I mean, that's with respect to people, but many times people said, oh, well, you learn, learn from your mistakes. Well, yeah, but if those mistakes end up costing you 500, 1,000 or 1,500 or $2,000 and you have endless money, then it's a great class. But I try to do so much forward research of what I'm doing that I don't make mistakes that cost me money. And on the B36, some were not my fault. People were making parts for me that didn't perform the way they said they were gonna make it. Um, but it was a very stressful project for me. And in the end, um, the money that was offered to me was gonna pay for the hobby for a while and I sold it. But when you look at this fuselage right here, 90% um, of it was balsa wood. And when we think about the design itself, when you start thinking about the drawings I did, and I've had a lot of people ask me how I do I design in 3D? Do I design in 2D? For me, and this is just the way I, I've been doing it, is I learned AutoCAD first. Way before I learned um, 3DS Max or um, Fusion 360. But um, I design in 2D and then I export it into 3D and, and it's called extruding it, which I actually give it a shape. And then I assemble it in 3D to make sure all my parts are the right size, the right uh, links, and uh, things like that. So I design in AutoCAD first. The B36 2.0, as I'm calling it, is still going to start from my original drawings, but there's gonna be some modifications, and I gotta test these modifications, but um, it's gonna be pretty cool. So I did it in CAD, brought it into 3DS Max, if you remember, the real B36 has a big truss running down the middle of it, and that's what I designed was a truss then with bulkheads, okay? Um, but something cool that I've been playing around with, this is my existing B36 AutoCAD drawings that I've imported into Fusion 360. And the reason I did that is, if you followed me for any time at all, I love to 3D print dummy engines, um, parts and pieces, flat parts, aileron parts. And one of the things on the B36 I did was I hand cut every part. Okay, I don't have a laser printer. And I've always wondered, was there a better way maybe to do the bulkheads? And I don't know if this weighs better yet because I've got to weigh it and test it. But what I did was, and I've already 3D printed these and tested these. Um, the, the, the thing that people don't understand about bulkheads is they want to build a bulkhead and then they want to cut a bunch of holes in it thinking they're making it light. Most of the time with wood, you're actually weakening it. It's better to use a thinner material and not cut holes in it than it is to use a thicker material thinking you got strength and then cutting holes in it to make it light. And I've learned this from experimentation. Some of you might disagree, that's cool. I, I'm not saying every way I do it is the way you should do it. It's just the way I've done it. But by 3D printing these and um, Right now they seem super strong and they're almost the same weight as the plywood, the, the light plywood I use, the eighth inch light plywood. So there'll be more to come as the B36 in two or three years starts to materialize. 
but I have been spending quite a bit of time on the 2.0 drawing. So the B36 2.0 is coming. Some of the neat things about it is, if you remember the truss, and you'll see pictures of the truss in a minute, the way I made the truss was everything slid onto the truss. By 3D printing this stuff, I'm leaving all of these holes for my air tubes, my wireways, and everything. And because the way it's being 3D printed, um, let's see how I would explain this. When you take plywood, plywood is um, grain going this way, grain going this way. When you cut it really thin, you actually end up with virtually no strength in the plywood because the grain that's going this way makes it real bendy. The grain going this way is either one or two ply. So by 3D printing this, and I did it with ABS as an experiment, the, the actual melted plastic, let's say, is going longitudinally around my angle and becomes really, really strong. So I don't know if I'm gonna do this because everything when I design is about weight. And everybody says, but you build such light airplanes. Yeah, I want them, if I could build an airplane that weighed a pound, that had a 190 inch wing, I would do it. Um, because everything is easier to fly when it's lighter, okay? So um, going back to my original design, on the left was the truss that I had thought I had figured out how I was gonna build it. On the right was some bulkheads put together. Before I get too deep, I wanna talk about my sponsor, RTL Fasteners, fantastic people. Uh, the screws on the bottom are servo screws, but I also use them to hold my cowings on, my canopies, fairings, and all that stuff. Every blind nut, bolt and nut, both standard metric you want, fabulous people. Here's the cool thing, and uh, if you go there and you buy $50 or more, use code DA30, you will get 30% off your order, which is a massive amount of money. So this is on the top, the hypothetical truss I had originally drawn, but I got lazy and thought, well, I'm gonna cut that out of plywood first and see how strong and what it weighs. So when you look at the bottom picture there, it's hard, a little bit hard to see. That was the balsa built up one that was the second attempt of doing this truss. The first attempt, was plywood. And the thing I found out about the plywood was it got really weak. Just like I talked before, when you start cutting plywood into narrow bands, depending on which way the grain's running, you can really start to weaken things. So it might be really strong lengthwise, but this direction, it wants, it wants to get all wiggly and wobbly on you. So I ultimately decided I was gonna do it completely built up using balsa wood sticks. And Two or three of my really good friends says, that's gonna be so weak, you know, Damon, we don't want you to waste your time. And I'm like, I think this will work. I'm, I'm gonna give it a try. So this is the right-hand side of the fuselage laying on my build table. And it's kind of hard to understand what's going on here. But if you look at the top, you see the two by uh, a quarter inch by quarter inch balsa wood. So if you look at the left illustration on the top, the darker, that's the quarter by quarter inch underneath it was quarter by half. So if you think about that running down the length of the top cord of the fuselage and that running along the bottom cord of the fuselage, it created an L. Then the verticals were the quarter by two and a half, but laying on top of it was a quarter by quarter. And that's the bottom illustration. My thinking was any time that you're joining two pieces of material with glue, you're actually creating a little bit more of a stronger system, okay? Now, I was blown away when this was done, how strong it was, and even my friends were. I mean, everybody was like, this is insane how strong this turned out. So what I wanna show you next is the little pieces you see in here were not glued in. Those were just jigs for me to get the dimensions right of everything. So when I put the crossbars in the truss to create the truss itself. And when you look at this hanging on the wall again, one of the things I always do is I have a laser and on a table, sometimes it's hard for me to get a laser where it really looks straight. Your eyes play games on you. So I had a spinning laser actually in, in my shop and I would keep hanging the left and right hand side of the fuse on this because I wanted it basically within one millimeter, the entire length, the entire 168 inch long fuselage. I wanted that to be uh, within a millimeter and it was when, when I was done. 
So basically, I then put the cross members in it, and this entire uh, truss here weighed less than a pound. It was crazy how light it was. And then I started cutting out all the bulkheads. And like I said, I hand cut every one of them. And look, I've had a lot of people say, there's no way you did that. It looks like laser cutting. If, if you take your time and you know how to use a belt sander, and you know how to use a bandsaw, you can cut lines that look to the eye almost as perfect as a laser cutter. Keep in mind, a laser cutter is cutting wood, so it's burning through it. Um, and if you get within about a 32nd of an inch of where you want it, and then you take a, band, I mean, a belt sander or, or a rotary sander and bring it all the way down to the line and then peel off the paper. See, I use the 3M contact cement, spray the wood really light, then I put the paper on that I plotted, and that's what I use as my template to cut. Okay, and it works really, really good. I mean, I've all the large airplanes I've done, I do it with this system. So um, I started sliding on the bulkheads, and this is where I came across one of my first kind of uh, challenges was if the bulkheads, how do I say this? The, if the truss did this a little bit, lean to the side, the bulkheads were going to keep it straight. But as the bulkheads was getting it straight, it was wanting to put a little bit of a twist into the fuselage because I never thought about what kind of cross bracing I was going to do on the top. I've got it on the sides for strength, but I wasn't thinking about my lateral stability. So I had to go back in and figure out how to get those. Keep in mind, once the wing would be on it, the fuselage couldn't do any of the wiggling around or anything. But while I was assembling this, I started noticing there was a lot of slop that was starting to show up in different parts of it. And um, while a lot of people look at this and say this is really simple, and it technically is simple, if you're trying to keep the tolerance as I was, um, it, it, it took time to make sure all this stayed square. And I didn't want to put too much into it yet because I knew I had to get inside it, uh, if that makes sense. So here was the, and it's just crazy how it could sit on a cardboard box and not sag at all. I mean, it was just incredibly strong. So one of the mistakes that I did make that was detrimental, I mean, it was a huge setback for me, is I started putting some of the skin on it when it was down in my shop. This is in my basement. And once I got all the bulkheads on, of course, you want to skin it. Now, I had broken the fuselage in two places so I could get it out of my basement, and that's what those joiner tubes are in there for. Um, here's a better picture of it. But I, I was silly, okay? I, I wasn't thinking far enough ahead of the curve because um, you got a Bombay passing through the bottom there. And the only thing that was going to make that fuselage structurally strong there was how tight it could fit together with those joiner tubes. So um, essentially, you know, uh, oh, and there's a picture of a uh, monogram B36 put up against it for scale. So essentially, I ended up with all these pieces thinking I'm going to skin this. And when I started putting the skin on it, um, how do I say this? My... My excitement got ahead of um, the steps I needed. When you're building something of this scale, you, you take a, a notebook and you write down what you think the steps are in building it. Because you don't want to build yourself into a corner and realize, oh my gosh, I now got to cut a hole in my, my airplane to get something in there. And to me, that was the hardest part of scratch building. I'm not talking about building from somebody's plans. I'm talking about if you've made the plans and you've never assembled this, you've assembled it in a 3D environment, but you never assembled it in a real world environment. There's so many things you just don't see until you start getting your hands in it. So um, right here is the joint that I was gonna leave where the back half of the fuselage and the middle slid together. And one day I looked at that and I thought, I hate that because I want the skin to go over that joint once I have it in, in my garage. I don't want there to be a weak point in my entire fuselage there. I want the fuselage to be one piece once it's in my garage. And um, I got a lot of it sheeted and uh, this shows the joint and this is where I had my epiphany and said, I don't like this. This, this, this will never be that strong. You're, you will see it flex on a 257 inch wing. 
So I, uh, here's another picture down the inside of the fuselage and another one that was showing the joiner too. I mean, this was just beautiful. So then I said, okay, what am I going to do with this skin? I love the fact it was coming in so light. Here's some of his skin, my daughter holding it up. That entire piece right there laid was less than two pounds. I think it was like, I think that was only like 18 or 19 ounces. And another picture of her holding it. And uh, the cockpit. Now, keep in mind, I, I started skinning a lot of this airplane. And this was just more of a mock-up to make sure it looked like a B-36 for me. And I was getting ready to skin the other side. And I just said, I got to stop skinning it. So now I take her to the garage and very carefully took all the skin except for the nose of the airplane off. So I threw all that. Well, actually, I used that balsa wood to cut down into smaller strips to use in other places or other projects. I never threw a balsa wood away. Um, but that was my first big setback. One thing I'm going to do is talk about all the setbacks I've had in this. Hopefully, so if you decide, God forbid, to take on an airplane this big, uh, well, I hope somebody does. You know, I hope somebody is as crazy as me and decides to build one maybe bigger. But everything about this plane is building it light. Okay, it's so important to think about everything you're gluing in this airplane. So I took all the skin off it, knowing that I'm going to go across all the joints of how it's going to go together. You see a bunch of air canisters in the nose of it. One of the videos we're going to do is talking about the bomb bays, because all those air canisters ended up being becoming scale nuclear bombs in my bomb bay, because I wasn't going to ever drop anything out of the bomb bay on this. I know a lot of people were like, why wouldn't you do that? It was never that intent. I just wanted to fly the B-36. So these actually got moved into uh, the Bombay, and you'll see that later. But then I had a challenge. Once, once the wing lays on this fuselage, there's things that I call tongues. And there's four tongues that went down. They were a little bit carbon fiber reinforced with a laminate. And they were going to attach the wing to the fuselage. But then I was worried about the top of the fuselage sagging a little bit. So I built this little, I call it an inverted saddle. I don't know if that makes any sense, but there's carbon fiber that then runs down that, and then that carbon fiber will end up running the entire length of the fuselage before I skin it, okay? Here's another picture down the top. Now keep in mind the back end is not on the B36 yet, but all the way that red line you can barely see there would run the whole length of the top and it'd be two layers of carbon fiber toe. That carbon fiber toe is good for like 2,000 pounds. So it would be plenty strong enough. And then I started to skin the airplane and was really meticulous. Some places I was able to cover the joint, other places I wasn't because of like the bomb bays and where balsa wood was going to start and stop. Um, and you can see, and, and I'm going to do a video on using carbon fiber toe. Okay, but I did use carbon fiber toe on that truss structure to give it strength. I don't know if it'd need it because the skin's going to produce a lot of strength and the glass. That's, that's another thing. One of the hardest things in building giant aircraft um, that I've had, and, and, and I'm talking about all the way back to the 80 inchers, the 100 inchers, all these different airplanes. The, the biggest challenge for me in all of these was making sure that, um, and ignore that phone ringing, it's just going to ring. It's a spam call because it's going, yep, yeah, it's a spam call. So the thing is, is, you think of a truss in the middle of the fuselage having to have a certain amount of strength. Then you think about the skin's going to have a certain amount of strength. Then you think about the glass cloth is going to have a certain amount of strength. We overbuild model aircraft so much, but, but we don't know. You know, I keep waiting one day for one of my wings to collapse because I built the wing too light. Um, but always be thinking in your head, you know, if I'm going to have a thicker skin on my fuselage because I need to do a little bit of sanding, um, do I need a heavier cloth? I always use 0.75 cloth on all of my airplanes because I don't use the fiberglass for the strength or rigidity. I use it as a base for my paint, okay, and to cover up wood grain. Um, this is a picture of the nose gear doors. And notice all the strips of balsa on the nose that I had to cut out, cut out to get it. Basically, I cut out a whole bunch of 3 inch and half inch strips that were about 48 inches long to do the entire nose. Um, and that took a week to get right. And then to get that nose gear door planted in there. Um, when you look at this joint right here, um, all the balsa on the top half of the fuselage 
was, um, how do I say this? There was no weak joint. I was overlapping everything. That joint right there, I ended up cutting the balsa wood back one more bulkhead so I could put the strip there and not have that joint exposed where the rear half and the front, middle half, third, the middle of the fuselage of the back, third, of the airplane, and the front third went on. I want to make sure that there was no exposed joints. <clears throat> this is what it looks like when I, I, I got it closer to being done. And that's what it looked like on its back. You can see the bombs inside the bomb bay there. There are air tanks. Uh, but I'm going to do a whole video on the bomb bay and how that worked and how every all the systems went inside it. But one of the things in designing this was how many times I did things wrong. And then I had to figure out, okay, how many steps backwards do I got to go to get it to the way I want it to be? Uh, I know I'm a perfectionist and there's probably a little bit of OCD in me. So there's certain points that you got to say, is it good enough? And to me, that's been the biggest struggle in model aviation from the designing and building. Is it good enough? Um, we never want safety to be compromised ever. But, you know, if I build a plane and when it's done, it weighs 115 pounds and it could have been 110. You know, I wish I would have done the 110. But if I get a plane done, and it's 115. And the best I could have gotten was 113. You know, I, I got to tell myself to get over it. So um, one of the most exciting things for me when the airplane was at the point I was getting ready to put all the final skin on it, keep in mind I left all the top skin off to make sure I could get all my systems in, is that I did a couple of structural load points on the airplane to see if the fuselage was going to sag. It didn't. Were the wings going to sag more than that was scale? If you look at B-36 pictures, very few of them sitting on the ground ever look like the wings drooped. But when it was flying, you could see that the wings bent up just a little bit, not a lot. Um, but it never really drooped much sitting on the ground. And in this picture here, I had about a one degree droop, which really ate me up, but I had to get over it. So the most important things, and, and that's our last slide, everybody, but I want everybody to understand, if, if you're going to do the drawings and then you're going to build the airplane, you will find out as you are building the airplane that your drawings need to be updated or your drawings need to be modified. I don't know how many times I cut out a part, actually had it in the airplane, and then realized I need a hard point for the landing gear there. I need a hard point for a flap. There might be uh, a hard point for the motor mount. And I'll go in there and carefully cut out that entire piece with a Dremel. And then sometimes you've got to recut the piece that you can put it back into the airplane without having to take the airplane apart. So the original piece just won't go in. You have to modify that piece so that you can build it within either the fuselage or let's say where a wing rib used to be. Um, when we get into the wing, I'll talk about the whole, I built two whole wings for this airplane because of a landing gear manufacturer basically led me down a rabbit hole. Um, you know, people have talked about, you know, why this project took so long. And it's because I went into so many unknowns. I mean, there was just so many things that I did in hindsight. I never would have done it that way. But I didn't know until I started cutting wood. Okay. The cool thing is, though, I've already built this entire airplane once. So when I go to build it again, I knock on wood. I think I've got it all figured out. I really, really do. So thanks for watching my videos. Please like and subscribe and share my videos if you could. I'm really trying to build my YouTube um, just for you know, the sake of sharing all this fun and, and all the modelers and keep the, all the, the comments coming. I mean, you've probably told me 30 videos I can make, uh, you know, your request for at least 30 videos I can make over the next year. And um, probably the next one will be on incidences of the main wing, how you figure that out, which there's no math. You just look at the way the airplane that is built, you're going to copy, pick an airfoil close. There's going to be incidents, airfoils, and aircraft stability. Stability. So that's going to be my next video I should have in the next three to four days. And uh, I try to make everything like Fisher Price level, everybody. I mean, if you're here to learn all of the math and all of that, that's not where I come from. I want airplanes I can build and just fly. I don't want to spend all my time doing math because bottom line, 
if it's got a wing big enough, it's got a tail big enough, it's got a vertical stabilizer big enough, and you got enough horsepower on it, it's going to freaking fly. And if it's light, it's going to fly great. So rock on, everybody. I'll see you next time, and be safe. Take care.